This is where did the road go. Our aim is to explore the fringe, to be true skeptics and question openly, to investigate the paranormal, bring light to the dark corners of history, and give a voice to the shunned of science. We deal in mystery and the important questions that these subjects bring to light. What is reality? Who are we? And why are we here? Join us on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com for a full show archive, links to all our social media, upcoming schedule, and much, much more. Now, join your host Soraya on this week's edition of Where Did the Road Go? And welcome to this week's edition of the show. Tonight will be part one of a two-part interview with Dr. Rick Strassman. Tonight we'll be talking about his initial book, DMT, The Spirit Molecule. Next week we'll be talking about his new book, which is entitled DMT and the Soul of Prophecy. These books are very different, and his uh, research has taken them in some very interesting directions, as you're going to see. Other than that, um, if you have any stories you want to share on our listener story show that will be coming up some point in the near future, get a hold of me. You can uh, go to wheredidtheroadgo.com, and there's a whole bunch of different ways to contact us. And if you have contacted me in the past and I haven't gotten back to you on it, uh, drop me another line, because sometimes uh, stuff gets lost in the inbox a little bit. You can find all kinds of stuff on the show at wheredidtheroadgo.com. All the shows from the very beginning, all the videos. Um, of course, you can also subscribe to our YouTube or Vimeo pages. Uh, YouTube is pretty up-to-date Vimeo, hit and miss, uh, since most people seem to use YouTube over Vimeo. Of course, you can also get us on iTunes and plenty of other places. If you like the show, consider sending us a donation. It always helps. As well, if you want to help out, click on the links for the books, if you're going to buy one on Amazon, on our page, because uh, it does actually uh, come back to us uh, the fraction of a cent or something like that every time someone buys a book through one of our links. So if you are going to buy one of our author's books through Amazon, click on the link. It helps us out. And that's all I have for right now. So with no further ado... Here's the interview Luke and I did with Dr. Rick Strassman. All right, welcome to the show, Rick. Well, thanks, thanks for having me on the show today, Saria. Uh, well, and, uh, is 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 your name pronounced Saria or Saria? Saria. Saria. Okay, yeah. And your friend Luke. Right. Always a pleasure. All right. Now you you kind of revolutionized. Uh, certain aspects of the paranormal when you released DMT, the spirit molecule. And uh, this came out when? Um, it came out in early 2001. Okay. And how long was that in progress? How long were you doing these tests with DMT and such? Well, the actual performance of the research took place between, 1995, uh, between 1990 and 1995. I, um, and... Um, my thinking about this kind of work began a long time you know, before that. I spent a lot of uh, you know, time and energy getting ready to do that study, but the actual performance um, spanned you know, five years. Yeah, the, the, uh, you go into a lot of detail about how difficult it was to actually be able to legally study DMT in this country. Um, and it's just, it was really kind of astonishing how much trouble you really did have. Because even when you got permission to do one thing, you still wouldn't be able to get a hold of, like, the equipment and stuff you needed. Yeah, well, it was a process I like to refer to as Kafkaesque. Um, you know, it required, you know, two different uh, you know, parts of the, um, of the you know, federal government uh, to speak to each other. Uh, you know um, that weren't uh, that weren't accustomed to uh, uh, um, uh, well communicating, and the channels of communication weren't really open. You know between the FDA and the DEA. Uh, you know, so a fair amount of my work uh, just involved getting those channels of communication open. You know, and even um, you know besides the paperwork and the bureaucracy of getting the study off the ground, it 
you know, it took even longer for me to, you know, come around to the idea of doing a DMT study in the first place um, because of my long-standing interest in the biology of altered states. Um, I had begun thinking about the biological basis for unusual mental experiences, even in college. And once I completed my medical and psychiatric and research training, um, I started off, I started off looking at the physiology of the pineal gland and the hormone melatonin. You know, so all of that work took place, you know, before I even started thinking about a, you know, DMT study. Um, and I began the paperwork in 1988, and then, you know, that was a, uh, and, you know, that was a two-year process, which I, I, I you know, which I describe in you know, some detail in my first book. Yeah, yeah. It takes up it takes up a good chunk of the first part of the book as you get into why these things are so much trouble and uh, just the way that that hallucinogens have been treated throughout uh, modern history. Yeah, you know it's interesting because uh, you know modern psychiatry wouldn't be you know where it is without the discovery of LSD. Uh, you know the discovery. Uh, uh, the, the discovery of, of LSD took place around the same time as the discovery of the neurotransmitter serotonin and also at around the same time of the discovery of the antipsychotic drug Thorazine. You know, so those were kind of the three legs upon which the edifice of modern biological psychiatry was built in the 1940s. You know, most people think about serotonin and you know, psychiatric medications as being important uh you know but lsd was also at the same time uh you know uh it it, it was an area of the, um of extremely um you know focused interest for you know 20 30 years and until um the uh, well until lsd and you know similar you know drugs were outlawed or at least you know scheduled in into a highly restrictive legal uh, 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 category. Right, right. Okay. Now, as you said, you you were looking into melatonin, but melatonin doesn't have any uh, any effects like DMT does. No, no. But I you know, began you know with an interest in the pineal gland as such, you know, because it had been an object of you know veneration. Uh, within esoteric you know, physiologies, you know, for millennia, um, and at the time that I, you know, began my research career in the early 1980s, there wasn't much, you know, known about melatonin, and you know, some older studies, you know, from the 60s and uh, the 70s indicated that it might possibly have some profound psychiatric or you know psychedelic effects, um, and our study, you know, demonstrated that it's you know primarily sedating even in high doses. Uh, you know, so because it, you know, didn't, uh, you know, prove to be especially mind-altering, you know, I had learned about, you know, uh, you know, DMT in the meantime. And um, once I completed my melatonin study, I, uh, I, you know, changed the direction of my work to look, uh, you know, more specifically at DMT. Do you want to tell people a little bit about what DMT is for those those who don't know? Um, sure. Uh, so DMT stands for dimethyltryptamine. Um, it's a chemical cousin of serotonin and of melatonin, uh, you know, quite closely related, you know, chemically. Um, it's a, you know, relatively simple compound that's contained in uh, quite a few plants, you know, hundreds if not thousands of plants. And uh, it's been discovered in every mammal that's been investigated to date. Um, it's... Uh, a pretty small compound uh, with respect, you know, to the molecular weight. It's not much, you know, larger than blood glucose or blood sugar. Um, and it isn't an especially complicated compound for the body to make. Uh, you begin with dietary tryptophan, which is then converted to tryptamine, and then you add a couple of, you know, methyl groups to the tryptamine, and you get, you know, dimethyltryptamine. Um well, so DMT was discovered in you know, psychoactive uh, plants from Latin America, um, but it you know wasn't known until maybe ten years after that that actually it uh, you know is quite you know psychedelic, and 
Um, so that was discovered in Hungary um, um, b- um, by a psychiatrist named Stephen Zara, um, who was interested in studying LSD, but because of his being behind the Iron Curtain, uh, you know, Sandoz Laboratories from Switzerland w- uh, was uncomfortable, you know, sending... Uh, was uh, was, <clears throat> um, was uncomfortable sending it to him, um, and uh, and so he went to the library, you know, looked around for other possible you know, psychedelic uh, compounds, and uh, stumbled upon you know DMT, and you know so he made some in his lab, and uh, he you know took increasingly large you know doses orally, but there wasn't any effect, and and you know then he. Kind of flashed up, um, um, upon you know, the idea of injecting himself with it, and you know thus you know the you know, psychedelic you know, properties of DMT were discovered in the mid 1950s. Um, it was still kind of an obscure compound. Um, you know, Stephen Zarr uh, was uh, was uh, uh, um, um, was uh, uh, studying it. Um, but still, you know, the majority of interest within psychiatry was focused on LSD. Um, you know, but interest uh, increased in uh, with respect to DMT in uh, the 1960s when it was discovered in the body fluids of rodents, and then a few years later it was discovered in the body fluids and uh, the tissues of humans. Um, so that you know kind of opened up a large amount of interest in you know determining if you know, DMT you know, cause, you know, psychosis or uh, schizophrenia, uh, if, you know, the blockade of DMT could blockade uh, psychotic or schizophrenic symptoms. You know, so there was a, you know, burgeoning, you know, research field of DMT, uh, you know, which, like everything else, had to stop uh, within the human or, you know, clinical realm when these drugs were scheduled in 1970. Now you say there's there's some plants too that that DMT has been found in. Yeah, well, the most common uh, you know botanical you know preparation of um, of DMT is called ayahuasca. Um, right. It's a combination of you know two plants which are found in the Amazon. Um, one of them contains DMT, and uh, the other uh, contains an uh, inhibitor of the enzyme that normally metabolizes DMT in the stomach. You know, so I had, you know, mentioned that Stephen Zara, you know, swallowed large amounts of DMT without effect. You know, but the Latin American Indians discovered if you combine one plant with another, it allows the DMT to be orally active long enough, you know, to get into the bloodstream and exert its effect. And and that's always been so puzzling to me, how they figured something like that out. Well, you know, it's... Uh, I guess you could say it's you know it's uh, nothing short of you know miraculous. Uh, you know the Indians will you know tell you this, you know that the plants spoke to them and they said you know more or less you know combine us. Uh, you know so I mean that's as you know good an explanation as any because you know from a a statistical point of view the likelihood of combining those two plants for specific purposes is pretty infinitesimal. Yeah, yeah, and especially since the the initial results. I mean, when you when you take ayahuasca, it's not the most pleasant thing in the world. No, no, um, it you know will cause some vomiting, some diarrhea, some you know some nausea, you know those kinds of side effects. And you know, even though it isn't you know strictly speaking uh, an abusable sort of drug because of those side effects, it still is quite popular. Uh, you know, in Latin America, in Europe, in America, Canada, you know, Western Europe, uh, you know, and even the Middle East. And, uh, you know, the context is, you know, mostly you know, therapeutic or shamanic. Right, right. Now, is it the same type of DMT as you experimented with that is found in ayahuasca? Well, uh, 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 well, so DMT is DMT, you know, kind of like, you know, vitamin C, you know, vitamin C, if it's, you know, found right. in an orange or it's made in a lab. Uh, you know, so our, uh, uh, you know, DMT was made in a lab. Um, you know, um, you know, most of uh, the DMT on the street, at, at least, you know, pure DMT is extracted from plants. Um, but still, it is DMT, you know, relatively pure, depending on the method of extraction. 
You know, but our DMT was made in a lab, you know, met FDA standards, those kinds of things. Um, and, you know, because, you know, DMT isn't orally active, uh, in the street or on the street, it's smoked, uh, uh, usually, uh, you know, which means that the pure DMT is vaporized and, you know, then the vapors are inhaled. Uh, you know, but that, you know, can cause, you know, coughing and it's hard to get all the vapor in. Um, you know, so, um, you know, the older scientific studies had either given DMT intramuscularly or intravenously. And, uh, you know, there were, a, you know, a couple of, you know, volunteers in our study that had smoked, you know, DMT, uh, in uh, the past. And, uh, you know, and we gave one of them an intramuscular, you know, shot of DMT, but it was, uh, slower than the smoked route, you know, so then we switched over to the intravenous route, and, uh, you know, all the rest of our volunteers received it intravenously. Okay. Did you notice a change in the person's experience when you administered DMT in different ways? Um, well, we only gave it intramuscularly to one person, and uh, okay. it was a slower onset of the, and, you know, the peak, uh, you know, took a little bit, you know, longer uh, you know, to develop, and, uh, you know, the duration was uh, slightly longer. Um, if you smoke or inject intravenous DMT, you know, the effects, you know, begin within a few heartbeats, and they, you know, peak within a couple of minutes, and are resolved within a half hour or so. And in the intramuscular injection route, um, you start to, you know, feel the effects in a couple of minutes, and the, you know, peak occurs at around the 10-minute point. And you know the effects you know resolve at around the hour point as opposed to the half hour point. Hmm. Now with ayahuasca, the the effects take a lot longer to to build into the system, don't they? Um, usually they do. Yeah, yeah. You can usually you know tell the first uh, you know glimmerings of an ayahuasca response within maybe half hour to an hour. You know sometimes even longer. You know sometimes shorter. But you know I guess as a rule. You know, somewhere between three quarters of an hour and it, and an hour and a half, um, it's you know quite clear that you're beginning to come under its influence. Now, with DMT being present in well, most uh, mammals and such, is it mammals or all animals? Well, uh, you know, it's you know been determined in every mammal that's been looked at. Uh, you know, rats, mice, you know, rabbits, humans. Um, yeah, I don't think every animal has been looked at. You know, I've heard stories that some sponges contain DMT, some fish, those kinds of things. But um, I'm not quite current on uh, the latest in that regard. You know, but, you know, but every mammal, you know, seems to contain it. Which says that it's probably rather important to our systems. Yeah, yeah, it clearly is. You know. Um, it's, you know, produced in the lungs primarily. Uh, you know, I had marshaled a lot of circumstantial evidence in my first DMT book about the pineal gland, uh, which I think in a way kind of, uh, you know, sidetracked, uh, you know, focus on uh, the lungs, which had been established as the primary source of DMT for, oh, you know, close to 60 years by now. It was discovered in, you know, rabbit lungs and human lungs. Um, and, you know, an extremely interesting element of, you know, DMT or an extremely interesting property is uh, that the brain seems to expend energy to get, uh, you know, to get, you know, DMT into its confines. And there's only a small number of essential, um, you know, compounds, you know, that the brain expends energy, you know, to, you know, bring into itself. And, and uh, you, know, uh, you know, some of those compounds are things like blood sugar, you know, certain amino acids that the brain isn't able to make on its own for protein synthesis. Uh, so DMT is, um, is one of those compounds. You know, so it's as if uh, it's as if the brain requires, you know, DMT for normal function, uh, which is a very kind of mind-blowing idea. Um, and over the last, you know, couple of years, it's been determined, you know, that the level um, of activity of the enzyme and the gene responsible for DMT synthesis are quite active in the retina as well. You know, so it you know, it, you know could be uh, uh, well that DMT is involved in in uh, the mediation of you know general consciousness, 
and uh, even more specifically, um, it's responsible or it you know is uh, it um, it is you know mediating visual perception as well. Which yeah, so is this really... you know so this whole you know thing just could be a big DMT hallucination, but. Uh, <laughs> You have to think, well, would you live your life any differently if you were, uh, you know, like in a DMT hallucination? Well, you know, in uh, in my first, you know, DMT book, I, you know, talk about, you know, DMT is the endomatrix. Uh, it's, you know, kind of the compound that's, you know, keeping this, you know, consensual reality, you know, coherent, consensual, um, integrated with everything else. Um, you know, I guess like the blue pill and the red pill, uh, you know, it. I'm, I'm not sure if it's there's you know some kind of machine, you know, like intelligence, which is you know mediating the hallucination. Uh, you know, but still, uh, it is interesting, you know, to think about you know the nature of reality. If you know DMT is you know so you know critical uh, to brain function uh, and to visual perception. Yeah. So, in your study, were you able to determine the conditions when DMT? could be released naturally in large doses? No. In our study, we just gave DMT. Um, okay. You know, it's extremely difficult to measure levels of endogenous or naturally made DMT. Uh, the concentrations in the blood are, uh, in, are, are of the order of a billionth of a gram per milliliter of fluid. Mm. Um, and, you know, so we still can't quite, you know, get down to the sensitivity uh, to be able, you know, to measure... Uh, you know, naturally occurring levels of DMT. Um, I think one thing we may end up doing is, you know, looking at the expression of the gene, which is responsible, you know, for the enzyme that makes DMT, as opposed to, you know, measuring DMT itself. Or it, you know, could be that, you know, you know, that we'll have to look at specific metabolites of uh, of DMT, which, you know, may occur in larger concentrations and stick around longer than the parent compound DMT itself. Mm. Mm. Um, so if the lungs make DMT, uh, what is the, the connection to the pineal gland? Well, the pineal gland also makes, you know, DMT. We just discovered that a couple of years ago. Um, or it's, you know, found in the pineal gland of living rodents. Um, you know, we didn't quite, you know, nail down if it's made in the pineal gland of living rodents, you know, but it is, you know, found there, um, as opposed to being, you know, found in other parts of the brain, which isn't the case. Um, ah. Yeah, you know, so, well, yeah, I, I mean, I speculated in my first, uh, you know, book about, you know, the pineal gland as being kind of a lightning rod for the soul. Um, you know, but that was all, you know, kind of speculative and hand-waving uh, speculation. Uh and, uh, yeah, you know, um, at uh, the same time, I was extremely gratified, you know, that, uh, you know, DMT was, you know, finally discovered in the, in the pineal a couple of years ago. Okay. Um, and if the lungs make DMT, would, would certain breathing exercises excite the amount of DMT that is made? Well, that's the obvious, you know, conclusion is, you know, that uh, the lungs make DMT and if you, you know, if you can modify the metabolism or the function of the lungs, you, you know, may be, uh, you know, modifying the production of DMT. And, you know, it's, you know, been the case, you know, for millennia that, you know, people have discovered if they modify their breathing, it can modify their consciousness. Um, you know, like either extremely slow breathing or extremely fast breathing. You know, so that could be, you know, Did secondary. Did you notice any... Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say, did you notice any differences in the experiences had uh, by the individuals in your study that reflected their cultural background? Um, well, I mean, that's a good question. Uh, you know, the majority of the volunteers, you know, were Anglo. Um, they were mostly middle class. Um, there were a couple, let's see, there was one black you know, fellow, one Hispanic Indian you know, fellow, you know, one native Hawaiian gal. Um, there weren't any Asians. Uh, there weren't any East Indians. Yeah, you know, there weren't any African-Africans. Um, 
Yeah, you know, so, you know, the majority of the volunteers were kind of steeped in either, uh, you know, Wicca or Eastern religious, you know, practices. Okay. Um, you know, to a you know, larger extent, you know, Eastern meditation, uh, you know, disciplines. You know, so the majority of the volunteers, and I myself was expecting an enlightenment-like experience as the ultimate or the apogee of the high-dose DMT effect. Um, right. But, you know, to everybody's surprise, including mine, you know, that you know, was you know, barely the case. Um, as opposed, yeah, instead, uh, you know, of a, you know, formless, unitive kind of state, it was, you know, uh, quite, you know, highly interactive and, you know, full of content and, you know, busyness. Um, you know, so, you know, the one um, Hispanic Indian, you know, fellow, um, you know, can, well, you know, came in, uh, 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 to the study with, you know, certain expectations, you know, based on his, you know, shamanic, you know, practice and studies. And, uh, right. you know, he, among everybody else, was, you know, more, uh, more or less surprised, you know, by what the actual experience was. Hmm. Which implies that that those experiences, those, un- and then you get more into this in the second book, those uh, experiences of unity and stuff are not necessarily DMT created. No, no, I don't think that, you know, the, uh, the typical, you know, high-dose effect of DMT is a mystical, unitive, enlightenment-like state. Yeah, it's, you know, more akin, you know, to, as I discuss in, you know, my new book, uh, uh, an, an interactive, relational kind of prophetic state as described in the Hebrew Bible. Well, you know, it's it's interesting to speculate about, you know, the lack of a cultural impact on, you know, people's experiences or even a lack of their expectations, um, right. you, you know, coinciding with the kinds of experiences, you know, that they had. And, and, and I think, you know, one of the reasons is, you know, because of, you know, the rapidity of action of DMT. Um, you just, you know, it's really hard to prepare for it, and it's really hard to kind of, you know, um, you know to overlay it with yourself, um, with, you know, the longer-acting, you know, drugs like LSD, you know, psilocybin, ibogaine, ayahuasca, um, you can kind of interact, you know, with it as, the, as, you know, the effects develop, and you can overlay your personality onto it. But I think with, you know, in the case of injected DMT, it's just the drug, and it's just the effect, and it's just your brain under the influence of DMT. Uh, in a lot of ways, your culture, your personality, your expectations, all those things uh, become moot. Um, and you're just being, uh, you know, shown this pure state um, as opposed to it, you know, kind of, um, you know, kind of, you know, bending, you know, to your own, you know, fancies, as it were. Right. So you had said... Uh that people misunderstood some of your speculation in the first book. You want to go a little into some of that? Yeah, you know, I speculate about the pineal gland, which we've touched upon. Uh, You know, some people were, you know, kind of, you know, taking as a fact, you know, that the pineal gland is activated uh, at, you know, 49, you know, days uh, of, you know, fetal development, and it's activated when you die, and there's, you know, DMT released when you dream and when you meditate, um, you know, all those things. Uh, but, you know, those were in the realm of speculation. You know, they were kind of informed speculati- you know, speculations. Uh, I kind of, well, presented, you know, what is known, and then, you know, based on, you know, what was known, um, I speculated about, well, you know, what that could mean. Um, but obviously, I, I was not clear enough in distinguishing between you know what was objective you know fact and you know what was uh, more speculative in nature. You know, um, you know, a, a lot of people email me with you know wondering if certain states you know that they enter into when they dream or when they're you know about to fall asleep or just as they're waking up or when they meditate those kinds of things. 
uh, are a result of you know, higher than normal levels of DMT. And my standard answer, which I stick to, is you know to the extent that a non-drug experience resembles what happens when you inject DMT, it makes you know sense that there's some common underlying you know biology, and you know that common underlying biology you know could be elevated concentrations of naturally occurring DMT. Um, you know, but because of you know the you know, sensitivity required of any way to measure DMT, we still can't uh, state that with any certainty. Right. Okay. Um, it's it's unfortunate we can't test. Uh, well, we don't have a way to test how much DMT is active in someone's body because I mean, hypothetically, if someone had a paranormal experience, if there was an easy test, you could say, well test to see what your DMT level is. Mm -hmm. Right, right. You know, those would be, uh, you know, extremely interesting studies. And, you know, if uh, the assay, you know, methodology was there to be able to, you know, measure those kinds of extremely low levels of DMT, those studies wouldn't be especially, you know, complicated. You know, you, you could look at DMT concentrations, uh, you know, when you meditate, when you die, when you have alien abduction experiences, uh, you know, near-death experiences, um, all those things. Uh, you know, so it still may be, a, you know, like another decade, you know, before we're able to, you know, measure those kinds of low levels of, you know, naturally occurring DMT. Right. Well, you know, there are other ways you can, uh, you know, test, you know, those hypotheses. You know, for example, you can give, you know, somebody that had an NDE, you know, DMT, and ask, you know, that person to compare the states. Um, or you could give DMT to you know you know somebody that's been abducted, and you know have them compare the states, you know those kinds of things. And now, when when you administered DMT to people, did you find how how close did you find their experiences to be to things like near death and abduction scenarios? Well, the near death experience was quite rare. Um, you know, there was one uh, you know person you know that had. Uh, a, you know, pretty typical, you know, near-death experience. You know, but that was out of, you know, close to 60 people. Um, you know, uh, um, quite a bit more, you know, common were encounters with beings, which I was not expecting and my volunteers weren't necessarily expecting. And after I completed my study, I, you know, then, you know, learned about, you know, the abduction literature, which I really didn't, you know, know very, you know, much about beforehand. <clears throat> And, you know, when I compared, you know, the descriptions of those two sets of experiences, you know, they were quite similar. Uh, uh, you know, the buildup of, you know, pressure, uh, um, you know, once the experience begins, um, you know, fear in the beginning, a you know, feeling of a rush, which is a you know, typical effect uh, of both, you know, DMT and, you know, the abduction experience. And, you know, the encounters, you know, with the beings, the interactions. Right. And the you know questions and answers you know things being you know done to the volunteer you know those kinds of things were uh, you know quite surprisingly uh, you know similar you know John Mack you know came over you know to, uh, you know to my house in uh, in uh, New Mexico like about halfway through my study and you know we compared notes and you know he was blown away I was blown away it was a you know pretty interesting uh, you know coffee clutch you know that we had that day I bet wow. <laughs> Um, the, the, the thing, I mean, the UFO phenomena tends to throw a monkey wrench into any theory. And I mean, when you look at the, the comparison between the DMT experience and the abduction experience, it is very similar. But then with the abduction experience, sometimes you have multiple witnesses. Sometimes you have traces of stuff, you know, like bird marks on the ground and stuff like that. And it, it just, it's makes the whole situation that much weirder. Yeah. Well, um, well, you know, uh, you know, one of the, you know, very first interviews that I had when my DMT book, uh, uh, you know, came out was with Whitley Stryber. And, mm -hmm. and you know, he asked me, uh, um, you know, those specific questions, you know, were there other witnesses, you know, were there burn marks, you know, were there stigmata, those kinds of things. Um, you know, and, you know, clearly, you know, there, well, there weren't any. Um, right. You know, and I started to, you know, think about that. And, uh you know, came up, you know, with a notion of a spectrum of encounter experiences, um, and that, you know, and, uh, and 
um, you know, so at you know one end of the spectrum, you know, were the physical encounters, you know, like body to body, as it were, uh, you know, where right. there's witnesses and there's implants and there's metal and there's burn marks and those kinds of things. And at uh, the other end of the spectrum is the purely consciousness to consciousness, you know, type of contact experience. And um, you know, if you were going to place the reports of my you know volunteers on that spectrum, it, it would obviously you know, be on the end of the spectrum, which would be, you know, the consciousness to consciousness end. Right, right. Yeah, none of them disappeared from their beds. and (laughs) No. No strange lights seen around them. No, no. It was all, you know, everything looked, you know, pretty normal, uh, other than what was going on in the volunteer's (laughs) mind at the time. Did you... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Well, I was going to ask, did you ever notice and maybe if there's a follow-up with um some of the subjects whether it changed their dream habits after they were injected um you know i don't really think to any large extent uh you know i I remember one or two volunteers once they began their participation in the study would describe you know dreams the evening, you know, before they would come in, you know, for their next uh, study day, and uh, those were kind of, you know, DMT-like dreams. You know, they would dream of getting DMT, you know, the night before they actually got it. Um, oh. But you know, as I think about it, I just don't think the nature of their dreams really changed that much. It may have been the case one or two people described remembering them more, or you know, maybe paying closer attention to them. Oh, but, you know, speaking of, uh, you know, but uh, speaking of the dream state, um, when one speculates um, about the nature of what is, you know, the DMT experience, um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the vast majority of the volunteers were quite clear in distinguishing between, you know, dreams and the DMT effect. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, some right. people have you know, you know, kind of wondered, well, isn't DMT like a dream? You know, but if you ask any of the volunteers, you know, they would say it's not a dream. It's completely different than a dream. It's, you know, much more coherent. You're, um, you're much more alert. You're able to interact, you know, with it a lot um, more intimately. You're not asleep, uh, you know, things like that. Right. And they they also describe it as more real than real, which is a description you hear both in near-death experiences and sometimes in abduction accounts as well. Right, right. You know, so that's you know, so that's say another you know, uh, you know, characteristic you know that distinguishes you know the DMT response to dreams is you know the feeling that it is, uh, you know, that it is um, either as real or more real than real than everyday reality. Now. Um, have you done any comparisons between the DMT state and uh, Kundalini? No, um, I haven't. I don't know much about Kundalini. Uh, you know, like in college, um, um, I read Gopi Krishna's books on his own Kundalini experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, in the early nineteen you know seventies or so. Um, you know, but I kind of. Uh, didn't really look into that much when I was, uh, you know, kind of working on other explanatory, you know, models for the DMT effect. Okay. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, that, that you mentioned Kundalini because I was uh, corresponding with a gentleman from Connecticut who was, he was a president or past president of the, you know, Kundalini Association of America or you know, something like that, you know, back in the day and. Uh, you know, he was quite struck, you know, by the similarities and descriptions. Uh, you know, but I, you know, you know, but other than the account of, you know, of uh, you know, Gopi Krishna, um, I haven't really looked into it. Well, having had uh, some spontaneous Kundalini awakening of my own that was pretty intense, um, as you're especially reading through your second book, there's a lot of connections uh, between the experiences I had and some of the imagery and uh, feelings that people had under DMT. Okay, well, like what? uh, Like the heat and cold sensations, the shaking, um, and even visual hallucinations. Um, 
So there, there's there's a lot of bits and pieces there that are similar. It's not the same thing, but it seems like there are some similar characteristics. Yeah, yeah, you know, so that makes sense too. You know, because of the lungs that that are used, you know, so vigorously in Kundalini. Um, you know, so that could be either you know because of increased you know DMT release as a result of the uh, you know breathing exercises or a you know downstream effect you know because of the chemical you know changes in the blood which uh occur um, as a result of that kind of breathing you know like the acid base balance in the blood right. change which you know then could affect DMT as opposed to it you know coming directly from the lungs let's say Hmm. Yeah, see, mine, mine wasn't done through breathing exercises. Mine's just, mine happened spontaneously. Oh. I had no, no, no idea what it was for about 10 years until I came across the concept of Kundalini. Um, so that just came out of the blue, like you were just, you know, watching Seinfeld or something? And, and, yeah, you know. exactly. <laughs> well, that's... It, was, it, was a, it was a pretty unpleasant situation. I went into it a few weeks ago on this show. Huh, well, that's interesting. Yeah, uh, well, you know, um, I you know think at some point it would be of you know value to compare the DMT and the Kundalini experiences. And uh, I suspect I've probably had spontaneous DMT release as well, because I've had very odd experiences that were overlapping with real life, but would also maybe be labeled as feeling more real than real. Like I felt more co more coherent, more conscious than I normally would, and then odd things would be happening around me. Yeah, and, and well, so that's you know kind of what occurred with our DMT volunteers is you know that they'd open their eyes in the beginning of the effect, and the DMT space would be overlaid on you know the room itself. You know, so that was kind of disorienting, and it led us to put you know. Uh, you know, black eye shades on everybody after the first few weeks of you know that kind of disorienting effect you know taking place. Yeah, didn't didn't someone see like beings coming through the walls or something? Yeah, yeah, they came through the door, or they or you know they were trying to come through the door, kind of spooked all of us. <laughs> yeah, you comment that uh, most participants would encounter some kind of being or entity, right? Yeah, I would say at least half, you know, maybe two-thirds. And, you know, if you include, you know, sentient things other than beings, you know, like sentient, you know, patterns, you know, sentient furniture, um, right. you know, sentient colors, you know, there was that intelligence, that, uh, you know, feeling of being interacted with, being felt, seen, heard, listened to, you know, communicated with. You know, if you included those kinds of phenomena, you know, the percentage would you know, probably increase even more. Hmm. Hey, you want to tell people a little bit about the different types of beings people would encounter? Well, they kind of ran the gamut, uh, you know, to inanimate things, you know, like furniture or statuary, um, machines, uh, humans, humanoids, uh, plants. Trees, cactuses, insects, uh, you know, reptiles. Um, yeah, you know, it kind of ran the gamut. Uh, you know, hybrids, you know, kinds of, you know, living machine, uh, you know, combinations, you know, chimeras. Um, you know, machinery would, uh, you know, sometimes uh, play an important role. You know, but usually, you know, living things. Uh, Either plants, animals, insects. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, every day. Uh, well, every day in you know the normal everyday, uh, you know, kinds of uh, of things. Okay. And what what at what point did you start to think that maybe these weren't just hallucinations that they were tuning into possibly something else? Well, I started to think about that as the study progressed, but I really didn't, you know, work on, you know, developing, you know, that idea on, on until after I completed the study. Um, you know, but I kind of, you know, needed to start to treat the reports of the volunteers as if, you know, they were real, you know, rather than hallucinations. Um, because otherwise, if I responded to volunteers' accounts with any skepticism, 
uh, in response to their, you know, feeling that the encounter was as real or more real than everyday reality. You know, then the you know volunteers started clamming up, and they started to you know feel embarrassed or judged or you know uh, you know those kinds of responses. You know, so at a certain point, um, I decided to you know, take at face you know value um, the descriptions of the volunteers. Um, otherwise, they weren't uh, as forthcoming uh, as would be the case if I would respond to them as if they had just been hallucinating or it was wishful thinking from some kind of unconscious, you know, psychological conflict, uh, or it was, you know, delusion or illusion. Um, you know, so once I began to treat their accounts as, you know, matter of fact, like, oh, okay, that's familiar, I've heard that, and yeah, that seems to be the case, and let's talk more about it, you know, like... Uh, if I responded to the accounts as if they were discussing, you know, something uh, that was as real as them going to the supermarket in the morning, um, the, you know, the conversation was able, you know, uh, you know, to get back on track a lot, uh, well, a lot more easily. What um, what kind of after effects did? Did the DMT have on these people? Was it significant? Did it diminish over time? Um, I think overall, you know, the most, I guess, you know, uh, you know, generic statement is it established a new you know, benchmark, you know, for their psychedelic experience. You know, they had never been, you know, so altered in their entire lives. Um, well, the, you know, well, uh, well, the majority anyway. You know, there was a small number. Uh, volunteers without, you know, you know, too much of a response, or it was, you know, comparable to their other psychedelic experiences. But you know, for the majority, it was the most, um, it was, you know, the most altered state of consciousness, you know, that they, well, that they, um, you know, well, that they had ever experienced. Um, you know, so other than, well, you know, so they all, you know, also were convinced of, you know, the reality of, you know, the DMT world. Um, and, you know, they were able to describe it in great, uh, in, you know, great detail. Um, I think especially as a result of, you know, uh, well, of, uh, well, of me being in the room as, you know, they were coming down and I was able to, you know, uh, you know to ask them um, a lot of, you know, questions about what, you know, they had, a, uh, you know, uh, you know, regarding... Uh, what the experience was like. Um, otherwise, you know, the memory can fade rather quickly. Um, but in in you know terms of long term effects, you know, those were you know kind of subtle, uh, you know, to a large extent, and also took some time to develop. You know, um, at you know the end of my DMT book, I you know kind of conclude that overall the long term effects were kind of a wash. But um, I think I was uh, you know, premature in, you know, that conclusion, you know, because as, you know, time has gone on, and especially, um, in the context of interviewing a number of the volunteers for the DMT, you know, documentary, you know, 5, 10, you know, 15 years later, uh, I was more impressed with, you know, the depth and the profundity of the long-term effects. But still, they were, you know, kind of subtle. You know, some people weren't as afraid of death. Other people were more connected with their work and their families. Others, you know, uh, you know changed their field of uh, work. Um, uh, you know, others, you know, used the material they had encountered in the DMT state, you know, uh, you, know for, you know, for creative purposes, either for art or for, uh, more for writing. You know, the, you know, the shaman, you know, that was in our study was able, you know, you know to use his experiences um, in his practice, you know, so, um, you know, I think also I wasn't quite up on the long, you know, term effects, uh, you know, because of all of the, you know, conflict that kind of, uh, you know, was associated, you know, with the end of my study, you know, so, uh, you know, by the time I was, you know, concluding, you know, my book, um, I don't think um, I wanted to look 
you know, that carefully at, you know, the long term, you know, you know potentially positive implications uh, of, uh, of the project. And, and why did you stop the project? Well, I stopped it for a number of reasons. Uh, I think the you know, simplest answer is I had learned all that I really, you know, kind of came to, you know, to the research, you know, to learn from or about. Um, mm -hmm. I, you, know, um, you know, by the time I had completed the study, I had given a lot of DMT to a lot of people. Um, and I wasn't really sure, you know, how to understand it. You know, so I didn't feel that... Um, you know, good about, you know, kind of, you know, pushing people off of this cliff without really understanding, you know, where they were going. You know, so um, I had plenty of material, you know, to think about. You know, nobody was, you know, severely, you know, damaged or if, you know, if, you know, they developed, you know, depression or panic attacks after the study, which, you know, took place in, you know, maybe three people or so, you know, you know, those were, you know, short-lived adverse effects. You know, so um, I had given a lot of DMT. I was getting kind of worried about, you know, my lack of a cogent, you know, kind of model. Um, you know, uh, it was really stressful work without a team around me. I was kind of doing it on my own primarily, uh, you know, because our studies were, you know, kind of came out of the blue, uh, you know, as you know, far as, you know, the rest of, you know, the psychiatric research community was concerned, you know, so uh, I didn't really have any colleagues, you know, to bounce ideas off of back and forth. Um, you know, my Zen community was uh, uncomfortable with my work, even though they had been supporting it informally over the years. Um, you know, my wife got sick, and, you know, she wanted to go back to Canada, you know, where she's from. Um, you know, my, you know, my body, you know, worker was, you know, kind of, uh, you know, giving me the heebie-jeebies about, uh, you know, you know, the paranormal, you know, qualities of the work I was doing. I wasn't, you know, so great, you know, for the other world and the, you know, kind of, you know, thinning of the boundaries, those kinds of things. You know, so I figured, well, you know, I've given a lot of DMT. I've learned a lot. Now it's time to take a break, you know, before, you know, like I hurt anybody. Uh, and also, you know, the studies were becoming more difficult to recruit for because, um, you know, you know, once I established what the responses, you know, were to DMT uh, in the you know, psycho in the you know psychopharmacology you know model that I had brought to bear on the project, um, you know, that kind of required the blockading of certain aspects of the of, of the DMT effect. Um, and, you know, people didn't, you know, want to come in for a blockaded, you know, DMT experience. So uh, it was getting, you know, more difficult, you know, to recruit volunteers as well. You know, so it was, you know, kind of like, okay, I've done good work. You know, now it's, you know, time to think about it and, you know, figure out what it all means. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, you also said uh, the experiences were, or the memory of the experiences would fade quickly afterwards a lot of times. Well, you know, that's, you know, the case, you know, most of the time if you smoke DMT, the details, you know, well, they can fade anyway. You know, so, you know, me being in the room uh, when they came down and taking notes and asking questions, um, I think, was, you know, quite helpful to, you know, to kind of explicate, you know, some of the fine, you know, details uh, of people's experiences. Did you ever have anyone who had a very hard time remembering their experience? Um... Yeah, the first, you know, day of the DMT study, we gave two people a super high dose of the drug, uh, you know, higher than what ended up, you know, being, a, you know, the high dose. And, you know, and and neither of them could remember, you know, you know, much of what had taken place. You know, so we dropped, you know, that, you know, dose, you know, by a third uh, ah. and, and ended up, you know, you know, with our high dose. And it was a high dose, even uh, even with you know that you know dose you know zero point four milligrams per kilogram. Um, a few people were a bit confused uh, in the study, or you know were confused in that state, and you know kind of you know bemoaned you know the fact that they couldn't you know remember you know more you know. But the vast majority you know were able to recall you know things in exquisite detail actually. Hmm. Okay, because I, I always wonder how much, 
I mean, kind of like when you have a dream, a lot of times, you know, people don't remember any of their dreams, or you wake up remembering it, and then it's gone. Um, and I wonder if that also relates to altered states like, say, a near-death experience. You know, does everyone who dies and is brought back have a near-death experience, but only certain people are capable of remembering it? Or is it only happening to certain people? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I suppose, you know, it would relate to the profundity of the experience and, you know, and, you know, the sense, uh, well, and, you know, the sense of reality. You know, if it seemed, you know, dreamlike, uh, it would be ephemeral and you wouldn't, you know, remember it, you know, that well if it weren't, for example, an extremely, you know, profound dream. You know, um, you know, but the majority of, you know, dreams are, you know, kind of ephemeral. You wake up and they evaporate. Um, you know, but the DMT response uh, state is, you know, quite profound. Uh, you know, so uh, I think if people are questioned about it, interviewed, you know, they can certainly remember a lot. And, you know, if you speak with people that have smoked, you know, DMT, you know, you know, um, you know they'll... Uh, speak of the profound, you know, nature and, you know, how the you know, memory is kind of uh, imprinted in, in, into their minds, you know, that they'll never forget it. Okay. All right. Luke, do you have any other questions for him on the first book? Yeah. Uh, well, it's just a general question, but did this study change your, let's say, ontology, how you looked at the world? Uh, well, completely. Yeah, yeah, completely. Uh, it completely turned my world upside down in a number of ways. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so that was part one of the interview with Dr. Rick Strassman. Next week is part two. And if I didn't announce it already, August 1st will be the next part of the UFO History series with Aaron Gullius and Mike Clout.